Introduction Here's a quote from A Course in Miracles. The ego is afraid of the spirit's joy, because once you have experienced it, you will withdraw all protection from the ego and become totally without investment in fear. Are you ready to meet your unlimited self? There is a good chance that as you are reading this book, then, the answer is yes. Even if you don't know exactly what it means to be unlimited. I have an idea about what it is to be unlimited. And in these pages, I'm going to share the very steps I took and keep taking to unlimit myself. This is a guidebook. It is highly practical. Every piece of knowledge is backed up by a replicable practice that I have used on my own path of becoming unlimited and wildly intuitive. The depth of the relationship we have with our intuition will be determined by the commitment we make to these practices. Step one is accepting that we are intuitive because we are the same unlimited consciousness as God. Step two is committing to these practices living our life from this knowing. We are not chasing down our intuition. We are instead going on a spiritual adventure to understand what intuition actually is, how the universe is truly configured, and to discover we are already in possession of all that we need to live a life of unlimited consciousness. Let's begin. I have walked a very particular path to meet my unlimited self, My path is the path of intuition. I consider intuition to be the most powerful capacity we have to reconnect to our unlimited selves in every moment of our lives. Yet there are a number of roadblocks between our very natural, innate, intuitive power and us. These blocks or problems, which as we'll see are not really problems at all, are the reason why we are largely disconnected from our unlimited selves individually and as a civilization. So what are these blocks? First problem. We have lost our spiritual self-esteem. We hide from spiritual nature not because we don't believe it is real. We hide from it because we do not believe we are worthy of it. Caroline Mace, the great medical intuitive and contemporary mystic, states that without self-esteem we cannot become conversant in intuition. More than anything, Intuition is the sign of a healed mind. The healing is of the belief in separation. If you know that you are one with all there is, how can you not have the answers to every question? To increase our intuition, we need to increase our self-worth. And that is very confronting, because we want to know what oracle cards to buy, or how to use the pendulum, or which crystal to work with. There is none of that here. We need nothing outside of ourselves. We are the oracle. We are entitled to have an unmediated relationship with God, and I will show us how. There is only one impediment to us knowing that we are able to commune with the infinite, and that is to overcome our fear that we are not worthy. This is what it is to be spiritually fierce. To be spiritually fierce is to surrender our limited selves, even though it will take courage and discipline, and sometimes mean we have to sit with discomfort. We have become afraid of experiencing discomfort. We avoid it at all costs. But this is what spiritual discipline is, and the reward on the other side of the discomfort is great. Here is the second problem. We are having the wrong conversation about intuition. The way we think about it now is based on a schism, a duality that typifies how the Western consciousness has been evolving over millennia. Separation rather than union. Duality, this or that, is the antithesis of union. It perpetuates the belief in our separation from one another and the infinite. As such, we wrestle with truths that should be so ordinary as to be mundane. We question our soul's existence with the overly privileged faculties of our minds, completely missing the point of our purpose on the planet. 
We are only allowed to be this or that. When I was little, we lived all over the world. I changed schools lots of times. I liked moving around, and I liked seeing new places. I never had any trouble making friends. Something about it must have still affected me, though. There is something about not having one particular place to belong to. I used to have this recurring dream. I dreamt that I was in an airport or shopping centre only ever partially built, and across the mall or the departure lounge I could see my class of school friends being led by the teacher on some sort of excursion. The thing was, though, that I was with my new class going somewhere else. I would wave across the divide and try to have one group meet the other, but the faraway class never saw me, and they didn't hear me calling them. I would wake up in a panic. I wanted that divide to be filled. I wanted the two parts of my life to come together and see each other so that I wouldn't have to carry this enormous burden on my own, the burden of being divided in two. There is a good chance that this dream says a great deal about the experience of being born into our human selves and having to leave behind, or at least feeling as much, the heaven from which we depart. The experience of being human, especially as we begin to wake up to our soul selves, and by that I mean when we recognise that the human drama of money and work and relationships and worry is not all there is, can be traumatic to say the least. We yearn for a union, without knowing how or with what. We long for a connection, a way to leap across the divide to unite the parts of ourselves. We may feel, and I often have, as though we have been abandoned to this earthly realm, and until we cross over at the end of our lives, we are excluded from the experience of the divine in all its fullness. This is, however, the biggest illusion there is. All that ever was is now, and all that ever will be is now. We are in the heaven that we seek, and we are already the spiritual masters we so desire to be. We have not left anywhere, and we are not going anywhere. We are already there. Duality simply is not real. We are this and that, human and divine, and in this lies the secret to becoming unlimited. As my dream describes, humanity adheres to a dualism that does not really exist, yet binds us to making impossible choices, secular or sacred, masculine or feminine, past or future, divine or human, virgin or whore, head or heart, light or dark. Life exists in the paradox of these seeming opposites. We have forgotten our true nature is union with all that is, and the only path to wholeness is to overcome dualistic belief. We are at war with ourselves, sinking away our creative energy and disappearing deeper and deeper into the layers of illusion. We have become cleverer rather than more enlightened. Our cynicism grows as we access more and more knowledge. We are not awed and humbled by the magnificence of the universe. Instead, we seek to know so we can control it. None of our increasingly complex systems of belief or dogma have brought us any closer to being able to see through the darkness into the light that is the only constant and eternal truth. We are not spiritually fierce. We abandon our faith in a heartbeat for the comforts and superficialities of the new age. We always look outside of ourselves to find the cure, when all it really takes to be spiritually fierce and live a life of truth is to go within, to the God inside of ourselves. Instead, we have built walls between God and ourselves and wonder why we have lost the deeper meaning of our lives. We have forgotten that we are one with the infinite. As a result, we are trapped in reductive conversations about our intuition. We seek the tools, the external trinkets and the special magic belief system that will give us intimate access to our intuition. Or, as is the way of Western civilization, we dismiss it entirely. We dismiss it because we cannot resolve the spiritual paradox 
and if we cannot command it with our minds, we cannot engage with it. We cannot find peace in the paradox. The greatest paradox of all is that despite all our denial of the divine, we are impossibly drawn towards it.